congregation. School districts in Maine and New Hampshire have been invited by Drummond and Woodson to join the lawsuit. Drummond and Woodson has determined that participation in this She just says she's having trouble getting in, but I. claims are being asserted on behalf of public school districts. Our law firm, Drummond, she just says she's having trouble getting in, but I think she may have tried to use the, um, okay, a different invite. I don't know. Is she an attendee? So no. the host has to let her in. Nope. She's not in under that line. Can you just text her an invite? Mm -hmm. Or I can actually. I don't know. Oh, there she is. There she is. Okay. As soon as you'll, and there's Alicia. All right, I'm going to go ahead and call tonight's meeting to order. It is Thursday, July 16th, and tonight is a uh, Scarborough School Board meeting. If I could please have the attendance. Sure. Miss Durgan? Yes. I mean, here. <laughs> Miss Dictos? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Miss Casalonis? Here. Miss Layton? Here. Mrs. Sider? Here. Mrs. Turner? And Mr. Bennett? Here. If you could please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Okay. All right, seeing none, um, just check to see if there's any public comments tonight. I'll give it just a second. Okay, seeing none, moving into 6.0, the superintendent's report. Thank you, Leanne. I'm not sure if you can pull up those screens on the slides. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. So tonight I'd like to uh, talk about the school district opioid litigation information. Um, and I apologize if I'm going to read a little bit. I'll, I'll try to get through this fairly quickly. I have basically three to four slides. Um, across the country, there are lawsuits being brought by states and local governments against a number of pharmaceutical companies as a result of the public health cost arising from opioid crisis. Similar claims are being asserted on behalf of public school districts. Our law firm, Drummond and Woodson out of Portland, Maine, has been contacted by the national law firm leading this litigation. School districts in Maine and New Hampshire have been invited by Drummond and Woodson to join the lawsuit. Drummond and Woodson has determined that participation in this litigation may be a good opportunity 
for districts to join in this lawsuit for the following reasons. Participation in the litigation will be at no cost for the plaintiff school districts. Again, at no cost to the districts. The national law firm will be fronting all the costs and legal fees will come out of the money recovered, if any money at all. Minimal time will be required to complete simple forms and speaking with counsel at some point in the process. Although the ultimate amount of any recovery is unknown, we anticipate that participating school districts will receive a financial payment, most likely over a period of years to add to their special education budget. It has been communicated to us by Drummond Woodson that no cost, no risk, low potential of our, of our time. This is more than making a statement. This is a timely request in order to be part of the lawsuit. We will need to vote on this tonight. And so I have just a couple more um, things to say, I just, just to kind of break this down a little bit more with understanding. A major focus of these claims is the increased expense of special ed and supplementing supplementary education costs caused by the growing number of children born with disabilities as a result of maternal opiate use during pregnancy. Experts have estimated that public schools nationwide have incurred and will incur an increased cost in excess of $22 billion for pro providing these necessary supports and services to children with prenatal opioid exposure. As you know, this is a highly addictive drug and it has raised concerns across the country with our children. Exposure to this is linked with developmental delays with children and intellectual disabilities. In 2016, the United States re reached seven cases per thousand births which was more than double the rate only eight years earlier of 2.2 cases per thousand births. And so the number of undiagnosed cases likely drives the rate even much higher. School districts should be compensated for any expenditures that they've incurred, and more importantly, for those that will incur for many years to come. Basically, in the summary, as in all the negotiations, there is a strength in numbers. And a growing number of school districts, not only in Maine and New Hampshire, but across the country, are going to form this pact. Keep in mind for our community members, the school district clients will spend nothing out of their pocket for this lawsuit. Again, I just want to expense, uh, emphasize this would not be a cost to us as a district. And um, my recommendation is for the board to consider this. And then we can move forward with signing the paperwork with Drummond and Woodson tomorrow. Great. Before we open up discussion, is there a motion? Yes, I have a motion to make. Sorry, I don't have it on my screen. It's okay. I do if you want me to. I've got it. A motion okay. to approve the resolution that the Scarborough School System will join other school systems and file claims as part of multi-district litigation and bankruptcy litigation and to join the class action lawsuit settlement class in an effort to recoup damages caused by the opioid epidemic. Second. And discussion. Um, just to open this up, Sandy, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, in reading through the resolution and the information that Drummond had provided, I think there is strength in numbers. Um, this has hit Maine very hard. Um, I think it's important that we're making a stand and that we are standing behind the fact that this is a crisis that needs to be addressed within our country and within our state. Um, 
um, the, can I speak? I don't of know. course. Um, so I support the motion. This is the um, population that I work with and um, see the unfortunate devastating consequences that caused by prenatal exposure to um, opiate use um, and, and during pregnancy. You know, the litigation is limited to prenatal exposure. The, what it doesn't take into account is the delays um, caused by the neglect of parental use of, of opiates. And I think that that um, also causes a, a, a lot of um, additional behavioral, emotional, um, and developmental needs in our student population. Of course, that can um, is probably much more difficult to prove um, as it as it relates to the pharmaceutical companies because at that point um, there's a lot more parental causation but um, certainly the cost to school districts is much more expansive than than just the prenatal exposure I appreciate Drummond Woodson reaching out to us and, and giving us this opportunity after they've been contacted I you know they are um, such experts in their field that we're lucky. Um, but it's times like this where I wish that we could have the best of both worlds, their expertise, but also a little bit more of um, a law firm that was devoted specifically to Scarborough because I wonder what the options would be if we were to pursue this just as Scarborough, not as a member of a class action suit. Um, but I don't know that that's an option. And, you know, this is an option and it's something that they're recommending to us. So uh, for that reason, I support it. But there are times where I, again, where I do wish that we, that our legal advice was a little bit more tailored to our town specifically. Nick? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with, basically everything that's been said so far. I, I spent a little time today actually digging around and doing some research on just how widespread these type of lawsuits are around the country because I, when, when I first read this, my first thought was, you know, yes, the, the pharmaceutical com uh, companies hold a huge stake in this. They're the ones that are developing these drugs, but there's a lot of other players as well. So I was trying to get my head around exactly what is the target or, or what is the targeting of the pharmaceutical specific companies uh, specifically and what i came down to is kind of like a, a two-pronged thing just to share with everyone on this call as well as everyone in the public it sounds like these lawsuits essentially allege that manufacturers misled consumers by failing to inform them about the dangers of op opioids and overstating the drug's benefits and then two distributors failed to control opioid supplies and allowed them to be overprescribed in violation with state laws. But when I read that, it helped me refocus a little bit and understand exactly what these type of lawsuits are going after the pharmaceutical companies for. Because like I said, there are a whole host of others involved in creating the crisis that we have now. Um, and so I wanted to share that because I, I did the research earlier just to get my own head around specifically what these lawsuits are, are looking for. Thank you for that. Sarah? Um, I, I support this. I just have two questions and we may not have the answers to them right now, but it would just be interesting to know. And the first one is, have we actually been able to quantify what the costs have been to our district that would you know, fall under this claim? No, the, the, again, they, they don't know what that information would be at this point in time. Um, the recovery is unknown. It, you know, you might not get anything, but I think they're optimistic if this goes through and they win. Okay. That get it, just, to, just to clarify, I was, uh, wasn't asking about what we would get, but what, um, what the cost, basically what we're trying to get back. Like what has our cost been in terms of special education because of the opioid addiction. Um, is that something that we've quantified? I don't have that offhand. No, okay. oh, okay. Hold on, I'm bringing somebody then, in who does. Oh, I can't. Um, Kelly or Diane, if you could bring Allison over. Thank, Thank you. you. And just while we're waiting for Allison, Sandy, what other districts in Maine have signed on to this? 
you know? Well, this just came our way yesterday. So um, it went to every district in the state of Maine. And uh, okay. my assumption is probably most people are behind it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, so Sandy was saying, Diane and Sandy and I uh, participated in a webinar with Drummond Whipsom the other day, which also included New Hampshire. Um, we have never costed out, nor in special education, is there a coded disability of um, due to this. It comes other, under uh, other medical. I can tell you that I'm specifically aware of cases that we've either known at birth um, due to adoption or foster care, or um, over time, as they said, de developmentally, they haven't been meeting um, their developmental needs and then uh, stages. And then when we go into history, that becomes a possible indicator. Um, but um, as Sandy was saying, they're not gonna be asking any individual districts for um, uh, statistics relative to what we've done in the past um, as a class action suit. This will just be settled based on um, our percentage of identified students with, within our state. And that's how it'll be um, divvied out. Okay, thanks Allison. Sure. Thank you. Hillary? Um, I was just wondering if anyone knew, um, it, it, is the lawsuit targeted towards states like Maine that have, um, a, a, have identified opioid addiction and use as um, a, more of a problem than other locations? The lawsuit originated out of Chicago initially uh, with pharma um, suit with uh, that. I think you saw the information from Drummond Woodson. I believe there's about 10 other states now that have joined and that's why they've reached out to other states, specifically uh, Drummond Woodson. They shared with us, they embedded um, the law firms that are representing the cases. They um, did some of the research that Nick was talking about. Uh, and have um, passed on this to us. But I would say uh, it's a June, July 30th filing date. And so uh, they are expecting um, that a significant more number of states will come on board. Thank you. Allison, I just want your quick opinion. Um, I mean, I, I know we've talked about this before, but just to get it out there, you know, every year we see a a substantial increase in our special education needs and therefore our um, funding. And is that something that can be attributed to the increase in opioid addiction in, in your opinion, or maybe even scientifically? Uh, that's, that's a great question. I'm not sure other than I can, we can certainly document the increased level of um, emotional disabilities and significant behavior regulation and um, in our incoming five-year-olds. Uh, the even, you know, numbers don't add up equally one-to-one -one, and we have had, um, our needs have just been so severe with our incoming little ones. And so we've been able to track that over time. I think, you know, I've shared in the past a historical perspective of the number of incoming students and the number that require one-on-one -on -one adult support throughout the day. We certainly have uh, many more complex medical uh, students than we've ever had before. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. Seeing no other comments, I think we're ready to vote on the motion. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. 
Uh, moving to 7.0, it's an update on the School Transition Reopen Design Task Force. Great. So we wanted to give you uh, a little bit of an update. I know that at our next board meeting on July 30th, we're going to have a workshop dedicated to this. Um, but we're also aware that um, many people are wondering about the progress that the district is making. Uh, and so we wanted to give you a brief update tonight. Um, so for those who are not aware, um, uh, we have developed a task force um, and the role of the task force really is to review um, the most current directives and recommendations from the main department of education and from the centers for disease control. Um, we know that that's something that's a moving target and information is coming out on a regular basis. Um, we have uh, been considering input from some of our public health officials, including our district physician and other community members who are experts in their fields, um, as well as public safety, and all with the intention to develop a plan that we can present to you on July 30th that includes information about um, our physical reentry needs and protocols that would be developed. Um, health and wellness needs and protocols, academic planning, and also social emotional planning. Um, so to date, um, our work has included, um, our, our task force has met four times in June, um, and that's made up of over 90 individuals um, from a whole variety of stakeholder groups in Scarborough. Um, and we have subdivided those folks into four different um, committees, one on health, one focusing on operations, uh, another focusing on academics, and a fourth on social emotional wellness. Um, the task of each committee is to really configure three plans for learning um, per the directive of the state. Uh, what would continued remote learning look like? What would a hybrid model wherein we would have some distance learning and some in-person learning? And then if we were 100% back in school, what would that look like? And again, all of our planning is in line with DOE and CDC guidelines. Um, this is our, our stoplight in terms of uh, the plans that we've been making. So if and, and this is true for all districts in the state of Maine. And so I know that there has been a lot um, on the news and in the media about planning at this time. And so many of you have probably already heard um, some inklings about what are the plans if we're in the red, if we're in the yellow, if we're in the green, um, you know, so just, you know, passing along, um, you know, this uh, messaging that that we're using internally as well. Um, we have gathered some significant feedback to date. Um, prior to the start of our task force meeting, um, as we were closing out the end of the school year, there were surveys that were distributed to families, to students and to staff. And then on July 1st, uh, we sent out a couple of other surveys uh, because after the start teams did meet, there were some pieces of information that they felt uh, we had not gathered yet that would be helpful for our planning. Um, and we also were reaching out to staff to get information about um, you know, what their needs might be for the fall as well. So what I wanted to do this evening was to just give you a brief synopsis of uh, some of the information from the June survey and also from the July 1 survey because I, I think at the heart of all of this, um, in addition to doing, uh, following the recommendations from the DOE and the CDC is you know, a laser focused attention on what is the feedback uh, that we get from our community. So I'll start with the Panorama survey. Panorama Education um, is, some, is a, is a web-based service that we partnered with um, to give the surveys in June. Um, and so 
Uh, this slide talks about the community survey. And so um, there were over 1300 responses. And, um, you know, we'll just hit a few of the highlights here. Um, there were, uh, in terms of childcare, when that was asked, 24% of our families were somewhat too extremely concerned about child care um, in, in the remote learning that we had or in thinking about what learning could look like moving ahead. Um, there was also a lot of feedback about the amount of adult support that was required um, to help students during remote learning. 63% of our families said that uh, adult support was required almost all of the time to sometimes. Um, and then you'll see 36% said uh, that support was really only required once in a while or to a minimal degree. And 21% of our families said that um, they wanted, I'm sorry, this doesn't go with this, but 21% um, of our families said that they wanted schools to continue to operate remotely until a vaccine was available. Um, if we look at some other pieces from the survey, and, and again, this was in June, and so I'm gonna show you some things from July. And, and, and again, I think every time that you dip stick and you ask people for information, you'll see that, uh, things aren't always as static as, as we might imagine them to be. So in June, 63% um, of our families felt like uh, they would be comfortable with school being held on site in our building. 56% uh, uh, were in agreement about a blend of on site and remote. 30% uh, wanted to really make sure that there was parent choice in a model and 15% um, felt pretty solidly about the continuation of remote learning. And we also asked um, how would folks feel most comfortable about their, their children returning to school? And you can see there that, um, you know, the, the big pieces that folks felt strongly about were um, in terms of attending to social distancing requirements, um, taking a look at class sizes, um, and 50% uh, felt that uh, staff should be wearing masks, 43% felt that students should be wearing masks. Um, and then you can see 21% uh, felt like um, schools should continue in a remote mode until either more testing or a vaccine becomes available. Um, so on July 1st, as I said, we sent out our own survey um, through Google uh, because we were asking a more limited number of questions um, and, and we were looking to get um, some specific things answered. So the first question um, that was posed to parents uh, was about if school had to open in a hybrid model and uh, over 75% of our parents uh, were in favor of sending their students to school if we had a hybrid model. 10% uh, felt that they wanted to continue in that remote, in a remote learning model, um, and 14% were undecided. Um, we also asked if we were able to safely have a full reopening with all students. Um, again, just about the same number, 75% were in favor of sending their students full time. Uh, uh, almost 7% felt strongly about staying in a remote experience and almost 18% were undecided. And in the second survey, we had almost 1,200 families um, who answered. So pretty consistent um, numbers of folks that, that have been providing us with some feedback. Um, in terms of, we also wanted to ask a question in terms of transportation. Uh, because again, as, as we're doing some of this planning, not all of the rules and regulations have been shared. And so we wanted to find out what was the potential or the needs that our families had in regards to transportation. Um, because like many other districts in the state of Maine, if we were in a position where we could only have a limited number of students on our buses, um, 
traveling our students to school um, could become one of our, our biggest roadblocks. And so in asking the question about um, where they sat with transportation needs, 77% uh, of our families said that they could provide for their own transportation if that needed to happen. Uh, almost 9% said that they require transportation and that their students would not be able to come to school if the school could not provide that. Um, and then almost 14% were not sure at this time. The other question that we wanted to ask about was childcare, because again, we're very sensitive to the fact that, um, you know, that, that when students were in that remote learning model, um, that that created a lot of hardships for our parents. Um, and so we wanted to get a sense of where they were at with childcare moving forward, not knowing which of those three scenarios uh, we might be in at any time during the year. And so is there a potential for us to do some thinking and planning in that direction? 52% uh, of our families who responded said they did not require childcare. Another 14% felt that if their student schedules could match across schools, say we were in a hybrid model of, across phases, as long as their students were on a similar schedule, they would not require childcare. But 35% of our families um, did indicate that they would need to find some kind of childcare if either a hybrid or distance learning model were used in the fall. Um, and then we asked an open-ended question, and uh, that was a lot of fun to, to, uh, to, to pull all the themes from. And so I relied on uh, some of the work that I had done previously in my dissertation to do some codifying and to figure out um, what some of those major themes are. And I've listed them here, um, not surprisingly, um, and again, really matching up with some of the things that we saw in our June survey, the two big themes that came across consistently were um, that our, the parents in the survey, the narrative comments spoke to the desire to want schools to reopen in some fashion, whether that be hybrid or in in-person learning. Um, and then Right behind that, 105 comments that spoke to the need for more robust learning um, if we were in a distance model and to really take a look at live instruction, synchronous learning versus just posting learning plans um, and, and teachers, you know, checking in um, in the way that happened in the spring, uh, you know. Obviously, we did not have a lot of turnaround time when this pandemic started, but we've been um, really carefully reflecting and um, adjusting our course uh, as we consider the scenarios for the fall. Those were the two huge themes. You can see 109 comments for one, 105 for the second. And from that, the other themes really drop. Um, 39 comments um, about social and emotional well-being, uh, comments around special services. All of these are still very important. And so um, because they came up in the double digits, I wanted to make sure that we shared them with you this evening. Um, and so, you know, it's like the ability to meet requirements for safety, for, you know, kid opinions about students needing to wear masks, about social distancing, uh, that came up. Uh, transportation or drop off and pick up questions uh, were listed. Uh, there was some feedback about um, using a more traditional grading system uh, this time around and making sure that there was some explicit teacher feedback that was voiced um, child care, again, although that was a question that came up in the narrative comments, um, we did have 23 people write narrative comments about their desire to continue in distance learning. Um, some folks who thought that um, either we should explore some other models and options or that they might um, independently be exploring other options for their students. Um, we had some feedback in regards to 
how hybrid days would be selected and what are some other hybrid models that we might consider. Um, and then uh, folks who really wanted to make sure that there were still activities or athletics available for their students. Um, and so our next steps. Um, so early next week, although it may be tomorrow because we just got some news um, hot off the press before the meeting this evening, the state is uh, expected to be providing us with more guidance and requirements that would need to be met. So specifically what they've talked about is releasing a metric um, that, uh, that they're going to apply to say, um, based on this metric, the guidance is that your, um, your community is in the green, in the yellow, or in the red. It's going to be the decision of every local district to ultimately decide what to do about school opening. Um, the state has been clear with us now that they're going to provide us with guidance, but those decisions will be local decisions. And so they're gonna provide us with that metric and it's gonna be a metric on a weekly basis. So for example, um, and if you've been following any of the metrics, um, I, I looked at the metric a couple of days ago just to kind of get a sense for myself. Uh, right now in Cumberland County, the rate of um, people testing positive is, it was 3.7 per 100,000 residents um, the other day. That places us in the yellow. Um, yellow is anywhere from one case to 10 cases per 100,000. So to be in the green, you have to be under one case per 100,000. Um, and if we grew to over 10 cases per 100,000, then we would be considered in the red. Um, and then the other piece that we're expecting from the state is also some requirements about um, what criteria we would need to be able to meet from a safety standpoint to be able to open. Um, so whether that be, again, we haven't seen it, so we don't know, um, but whether that be about social distancing requirements or masks, et cetera, et cetera, we are going to be able to, we, are going to, we would need to be able to demonstrate that we can meet those criteria. Um, the DOE um, is also hosting some technical assistance meetings on July 21st and 22nd, so on Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, to help districts in terms of um, moving forward with their models. And um, our task force meetings uh, are also happening next week. And so, you know, we were really hopeful when we set the timing for our next task force meetings that we would have some updated information from the state. And um, it, it would seem that maybe the stars are going to align for us because uh, we're really hopeful that we're going to have that information so that next Wednesday and Thursday, our teams can, um, you know, have a more realistic uh, look at where we think we may be and really hammering out um, those, those other details that we still need to work on so that by July 30th, we can come back to you um, with some really concrete information. And I apologize for my small dog barking because I still hear her. So I imagine you can as well. <laughs> oh, what happens? Diane, thank you very much. She wants you, Diane. What's that? She wants to be with you. Oh, she absolutely does. <laughs> I do have a quick question, Diane. Sure. Um, based on the metrics, and you had said, you know, right now it looks as though we're in the yellow. What, how frequently are we going to be following where we are in the colors? Is it something that every Monday we're going to decide are we red, yellow, and green? Or is it gonna be based on a longer period of time? How, how is that gonna be determined? 
my understanding and Sandy, you know, feel free to jump in as well because we've been attending a lot of the same meetings and hearing uh, similar information. But my understanding is that um, that information would be communicated out to us on a regular basis. But the decision whether or not we need to change lanes um, from what we're doing is still going to be a local decision. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Hillary? Um, Diane, you had said that they were going to be issuing um, guidance for red, yellow, and green by town. Is, did you, by like, act, like town to town, like Scarborough could be yellow and literally Gorham could be green? Or, did, or is it co county? So some information that we've gotten has said that it's going to be by county. Other information that we received did say by town. So, you know, I, again, there's, there's a little bit of mystery to um, much of this. And so we're, you know, we're hanging in and um, playing well and, and saying, okay, what's the information that we have today? How do we use that? And then understanding that we're always in this draft form um, and, and that updates are gonna need to be made on a regular basis. Wow. Good information. Any other comments? Thank you for all of the work you've been doing. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, I, I think we understand the anxiety and the angst that everyone has about, um, you know, the consideration of school starting. And um, I think, you know, we would like to have solidified plans just as much as everyone else would. So um, we're really hopeful that, um, that the information that we'll receive in, you know, in the next week or two are really gonna help to set us on a, on a solid path. Um, and again, allow us to continue to update the community about where we are. April? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, for any of our community members who are curious um, about any of the documents that the start time uh, that the start committee uh, generated, or if they want to look through the meeting notes, um, all of that stuff is publicly available. If you go to our website um, and click on the Scarborough Schools uh, distance learning box, which is where we all got our lesson plans for the spring. Um, that takes you to an, a separate page. And at the very top of that page, there's a link um, to all of the start documents. Um, and so if there are community members who would like to take a look, those are there. Thank you for reminding everyone of that, April. Okay. All right, moving on. Um, next up is the chair's report. And real short, real sweet, I don't think this one's me, but I'm going to say it, thank you. Um, Tuesday was a great day with the passing of the budget. Um, I think it relieves a lot of pressure from all of us and I really want to take an opportunity to thank our administration. Um, you changed that budget so many times. Um, thank you for being positive as we got through all of this. Uh, thanks for your flexibility, um, the finance committee. Holy cow, that's three years in a row. Um, two with the exact team, amazing work. Um, you guys are absolute rock stars with what you've done. And thank you to everybody in the community who um, put out signs, who rallied support. It was the largest turnout that we've ever had on a budget vote. Um, it was incredible. I hope we can keep this kind of energy and support going for the schools year over year. So thank you, everyone. Moving into committee reports. Not sure who's first up. I put myself first. OK. Um, <laughs> I don't have access to the screen. So Kelly, if you don't mind hitting the slide, please. Excellent. Yeah. So perfectly to piggyback on what Leanne just said, um, you know, as a communications committee, we were on a very shortened timeline for this budget cycle. Uh, there was not very much time between town council's second reading and the vote this year. 
And I just want to express my appreciation to Kristen and Hillary and to Sarah for also coming to our communications committee meeting um, and making sure that we had our talking points down and our facts and figures correct. Um, thank you to Kate for helping us um, to pull together some tables and some things that we had um, thought would be helpful for the community to make their decision. Um, this slide is just a sampling of some of the um, memes and social media that we put forward. Um, we also made good use of, and you can go to the next slide, Kelly. Um, thank you. We also made good use of um, our town web, our, our school website, um, and so the Swift Reach um, email. I want to thank Chief Thurlow once again for allowing us to use his space um, in the no section in the leader that is free of charge for us. Um, and so that is an amazing resource for us to be able to um, get some print media out that does not cost, um, that does not come at a cost. Um, and thank you to Kristen for writing the body of that document. Um, then a couple of other things, um, just to make a point, um, given the financial constraints that we were all feeling and the amount of work that went into this budget, uh, we as a committee decided not to place an ad in the leader this year. Um, and we did not do a roll call. And the reason I put those two things on the slide was I have seen um, some questions out in the community as to whether or not we did those things. Um, and so first and foremost, I just wanted to answer those questions. Um, and then I also wanted to be able to um, say publicly that when the school board uses Swift Reach to um, make an announcement like for an election day, uh, that does not come at an additional cost either. Uh, that is part of our subscription. And technically, it, you know, we subscribe to Swift Reach and there is a cost associated with that, but it's not quite the same as when a political action committee or um, private citizens organize a robocall. Um, and so it, it may be a, a difference without distinction for some folks, um, but I did wanna you know, make sure that that information was available. Um, next plan is to meet and debrief. Um, we'll go through our budget calendar um, and make sure that we um, write down what worked and what didn't. And so if anybody has any comments um, that they would like to pass along to the, the committee, we would love to make sure that we incorporate the board's thoughts. Um, and thank you to everybody who helped me last minute and you know eyes on documents. And thank you to Kelly for helping me with distribution. Um, and thank you to those cute little buggers who stood out on Route 1 <laughs> multiple <laughs> times during the day on Tuesday, uh, helping to get out the vote. Awesome. Thank you. Nick? That's me. Um, so it's been a while since we had a long range facilities planning update. So I, I reached out earlier this week to our district leaders and just asked um, because I've been, I drive by Pleasant Hill School every day. And so I um, had noticed that the portables were there. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to just give an update on the two projects that are going on. So right now, we do have placement of uh, portables going on this summer at two out of our three primary schools, Eight Corners and Pleasant Hill. Um, I got this update just this week, a couple days ago from Todd. Um, at Eight Corners, the two classrooms or one unit, there are two classrooms in a unit, and please somebody correct me if I'm getting this wrong. Um, the portables are physically in place. They're connected to utilities, uh, electricity, water, sprinklers. Um, there's a, a little remaining fit up and finishing that uh, still has to occur, and that's going to occur over the next few weeks. Um, Pleasant Hill um, literally looks exactly the way it's pictured there. I, I, I did some looking online for like um, stock pictures of portable classrooms and I realized I could like get on my bike and ride around the corner and take photos. So I did uh, today. So this is literally from today. Um, so the top photo there is the, is the foundation that they're waiting for to cure so they can place the units. Um, in the parking lot, it looks like there are two units, but actually that's just one. They come in two halves. And the two walls that are facing each other in the bottom photo, actually that paper just comes off and they just, they, they go together. They just kind of match together and make one unit that'll fit on that foundation up above. Um, so they're gonna be placed uh, with a crane as soon as the um, foundation is cured. That's why they're currently sitting in the parking lot. So I just wanted to give that update. Um, I know that's not, we don't think of portable classrooms as anything long range, but 
We also know that there's time and consideration and funding um, for our new primary school, which is down the road a little bit, hopefully not too far, but I have a feeling like these classrooms will be used for the next several years. And so they're a good investment for our children who need a place to sit. Excellent, thank you. Uh, okay, so this is, um, as part of the negotiations update, I thought um, we could do, we could do an overview of, sorry, I'm just, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. My AirPods are dinging at me. Um, I would do an overview of the recently ratified and signed professional staff contract. Um, the negotiations have been ongoing, so um, I just thought it might be helpful. I know you guys have a lot of this information, um, and obviously the contract is available online as a public document, but I thought I might highlight some of the um, the biggest changes. So, oh, I don't have control of this. So Kelly, can you go to the, thank you. Um, so just to review um, negotiations between the school board and the SEA negotiating team, um, started in February of 2019, um, and we worked really hard for a um, many, many hours um, from then until about August 2019, at which point we um, made the decision to try a mediator. Um, so um, the request for mediation was filed in August, and we got um, a date in October. Um, and uh, I think that was I think it was two meetings with the mediator. Um, um, and when we weren't able to reach an agreement in mediation, um, the next step was um, to file for a fact-finding hearing with the Maine Labor Relations Board. Um, so we filed for that in October and um, we got a date for that hearing in December. Um, and then once they made their, um, their recommendations, we were able to reach a tentative agreement in February of 2020. Um, a lot of the unsettled language that we went into fact finding with remains the same um, as current contract language. Um, but I did think, and so I thought that I would highlight some of the additions and changes outside of that language. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, thanks. Um, so one of the things that the um, teachers had expressed at the very beginning of our negotiations was um, that they felt like they have so many more responsibilities than they did even five years ago that the amount of meeting times um, was really infringing on um, the, their practice. Um, so we ended up reducing the amount of contracted meeting times by 25%. Um, and we defined um, teacher meetings to be time without administratively scheduled activities. So if you look at the chart here, you can see that in the expired contract, there were 20 meetings that were administratively scheduled for um, one and a half hours each and 10 teacher meetings um, that were scheduled for one hour each. So that's per year. And that was a total of 40 hours per year that they were contracted to, to be in meetings. Um, in the new contract, we were able to um, divided up a little bit more and then reduced the number of hours. So we divided it, um, we halved the number of faculty meetings. So it's 10 administratively faculty, administratively scheduled faculty meetings, which would, will only last for one hour. And then there are 10 um, administratively scheduled department meetings, which is like a, a smaller group that they can work together to um, design with their administration. Um, and those are one hour in length. And then there's 10 um, teacher design meetings that are one hour in length um, for a total of 30 hours per year. Yes, Alicia. Um, those meetings are the, does professional development occur in those meetings or those, is that, does that occur separately? Um, it can. And um, so it can actually occur at any of those meetings. Administrators can schedule time for professional development. Um, and um, they can also schedule time, uh, if, if they have time, to um, do some of the, um, some of the online, uh, not online, but some of the, um, it's not paperwork, because it's not on paper, but some of the paperwork that's required for um, 
say and what am I trying to say? That so teachers have to do um, some no teacher evaluation in their growth planning. Yeah, but what is it called? Like they have to log it, I guess. They have to log um, information from their for self evaluations and for um, lesson plans and things like that into um, eye observation, which is a is a program that they use. So sometimes um, they, that can be scheduled for that time. Um, we also did change the um, the instead of saying um, workshops. We start, we use, we're now using the terminology professional development so that it can be a little bit more flexible for um, what that might mean. Thanks. So can you, oh, thanks. Um, so the other um, topic that had a lot of changes to it was the um, um, section on leave, um, including sick leave and personal time. So, um, so sick leave was changed to be um, 18 days per year of sick leave for all staff. So um, basically what that did was it, uh, the reason I wrote plus three or minus two days there is because um, in the old contract, um, there was some division about when you were hired. So I think if it was, if you were hired before, I think it was 2010, you got 20 days of sick leave. But if you were hired after that date, you got 15 days of sick leave. And so instead of keeping that inequity in the contract, we, um, we were able to agree that everybody would now get um, 18 days of sick time. Um, so for most people, or for many people, that's an addition of three days. But for some people that was um, two days less than they were getting. However, um, we also added on the second bullet point, you can see um, bereavement leave used to be um, taken from sick leave, but we added three days of just bereavement leave that is not taken from sick time um, that can be used to attend a funeral or um, um, if you had to do any estate matters or anything like that. Um, so in the end, the, even people who used to have 20 sick days have an increase in one, of one day in terms of their leave if you um, if you put those two together. Um, the other thing was we added a section on parental leave. Um, it's don't don't misunderstand that this this didn't mean that we did not allow for um, maternity leave prior to this, but it wasn't specifically stated in the contract. And um, we wanted to make sure that it also included um, paternity leave and um, the same amount of leave for adoption as it would be um, for somebody who um, was giving birth or their partner. So um, that wording changes in there. Um, and then in terms of personal days, those haven't changed, but um, the teachers were, um, um, ha had asked that we remove the reason required. And so we agreed to that. Um, three personal days is three personal days. Um, and so as of now, there you can request a personal day. You don't have to say why you want it unless you're going over your um, three personal days. And that is remains at the discretion of the superintendent um, as to whether those um, additional days would be granted as unpaid days. Does anyone have any questions on that slide? Okay, so um, one of the other big topics was um, some changes to the stipend. And um, so I use the term um, RIF, which is a reduction in force that's um, in the event of a layoff. So um, there was a, a stipend committee that had been formed um, prior to the negotiations. Um, they had done some preliminary work on the stipend rubric. Um, we ended up changing that a little bit and coming to an agreement on an, on an entirely new stipend rubric. Um, it, you can go and look at it for yourselves. It um, takes into consideration a lot of different factors, including how many students are you supervising. Oh, and sorry, these are stipends for extracurriculars, co-curriculars, and, um, and um, sport, sporting teams and things like that. Um, there were a few people who, as a result of the new rubric, would have a lower stipend than they would have um, in the previous contract, and those people were grandfathered in. Um, 
And we also raised the lead teacher stipend, which um, hadn't been re raised in a, in a while. And we um, added a 3% increase per year so that it would be commensurate with the salary increases. Um, and then, so there's an entirely new reduction in force scoring system. Um, this again was a um, uh, change from what was in the current contract. So um, you are, it's, an, it's now a point system and those points are broken up by seniority, academic credentials, um, your certifications and any endorsements you might have and um, a small percentage of your teacher effectiveness rating. Um, and then in addition, in that section, there's some new language that um, now guarantees that any recall teachers, that means um, teachers who have been laid off and then asked to come back to their position um, will retain the same wages, benefits, and seniority as they had um, before they were laid off. So the next slide, I think. Is, yep. So then obviously, um, you know, a big part of the negotiations is always about salary and um, any increases. Um, we use a cohort group, which is just a group of districts that have either similar sizes, similar locations, or similar resource profiles. Um, in this case, the um, cohort group was recommended by the fact finding panel. And so um, the, the agreement that we were able to reach on salaries was based directly on what the majority fact funding report had, um, had recommended. Um, it's, a, it's a year one increase of, a, I wrote approximately, it's like between 2.5 and 3%. And the reason that that isn't as straightforward is because we had found, um, so, so teacher, teachers um, pay scales are based on um, lanes as, um, as far as what your degree is and how many credits you have. And then it's also based on um, a, the steps, um, which equates to how many years experience you have. So hold on, I'm just gonna close the door. Lila, can you stop singing please? Oh, I should have noted. Um, um, so what we found was when we when we looked at um, some of the comparison districts um, that there was um, there were some steps that were farther off than other steps. So we took um, a percentage of the total increase and put it into those specific steps so that they could be increased to the point where they matched up with um, with. All the all of the other steps in the um, in the rubric. So, um, but then in year two and year three, there's straightforward cola raises of three point five percent and four percent. And instead of showing you the giant matrix of numbers, I thought I would put together just three examples of different teachers um, and what the the contract would do for them. So um, this is teacher A. She has her bachelor's degree and um, is in her first year of teaching. So that equates to um, the BA lane, which is the bachelor's lane, and she would be on step one. Um, so this year in 2019, 2019 and 20, her salary is $40,063. And the cohort average salary is $41,427. So as you can see, it's not the same. And yet when you cost it out per diem, it actually is um, right at the average. That is because um, different districts have different amounts of contracted days. Um, so a lot of times it's easier to look at the per diem cost or the per diem salary um, because if one district has 185 days contracted and, and another district only has 181 days contracted, then your annual salary isn't going to be um, as um, specific of a comparison. So I just, I did put the annual salaries, but in parentheses, I did the per diem. Now, if this same teacher is hired next year, so she's still um, BA and she's on step one, her salary um, increases to $41,466, um, which again 
uh, if you look at the per diem rate is um, is the average, e equa equates to the average. So she's just starting out. And then um, I have teacher B who is kind of mid-career um, or early mid-career, I guess. Um, he has been teaching for nine years and has since earned his master's degree. So now he's moved over a lane from his the BA lane over to the MA lane for master's. Um, and he's now on step 10 because he's been working for nine years. So this year, his salary um, is $327 per diem. And the cohort average is still a little bit higher than that. So um, we're not as close on the this mid-range, um, this mid-level as we are on the earlier level. Um, and then next year, if this same teacher um, with his same nine years and master's degree, um, he would be making $338 per diem, which again is now a little bit higher than the average. So not again. So now is a little bit higher. So they have um, he has made some gains on the cohort um, between years one and two. Oh, and just so you know, the, the contract actually does go another year, but so few of our cohort groups have a contract that go another year that it doesn't make sense to do a comparison there. But um, obviously this, um, this 2021 year that they will be getting a 4% raise from there for year three. Once some of the other districts that um, we have in our comparison group have um, renegotiated and have contracts that go through that third year, we can do a, a, another comparison there. But for now, there's only two. And so it's not really a fair comparison. Um, okay, so this is teacher C. She now has um, earned her master's degree plus 15 credits um, of further professional development work. Um, and she has been teaching for 19 years. So this year, um, she's making $407 per diem, which is above average by $765 um, per day. And next year, the same teacher who is in, so again, she's changed lanes now to MA plus 15 um, and has is on step 20 of the scale, will be making $422 per diem, um, which is um, again, um, above that, the cohort average by $11. Um, so um, we're glad that to see that our teachers have made gains. Um, if you just take a snapshot in, of these three, um, these three steps. Um, and like I said, we can do a, a further comparison of year three of our contract once some of our cohort districts have um, that year. Um, and that's about it. Does anyone have any questions regarding the contract? Thank you, Hillary. That was great. Um, so, and then separately, or I guess tangentially related, I just wanted to also um, do an update on some of the concessions. Um, I think last time we had uh, we had announced that we were meeting, we were asking to meet with um, our collective bargaining units um, regarding concessions that might help us this school year with all the unknown costs of um, preparing for. Um, learning with COVID-19. And um, we have met and um, just had um, productive conversations and come to, um, I, I won't even call it a tentative agreement because it's not a, a document in some cases, but um, we have come to um, conclusions with the teachers, um, the educational support professionals, which is also known as the ESP contract, um, the administrators and our superintendent. So um, the, the teachers, um, they have any agreement that, that um, we might have between the negotiations teams will have to be ratified by their membership. Um, although, so that's why that has an asterisk next to it. So more information um, should be forthcoming um, regarding that. And then the educational support professionals, because their contract year was ending, their concessions are actually embedded within a new contract. And so um, because that's a, an actual new contract, it needs to be ratified by both parties. Um, so that again, is like a slightly longer process. Um, the administrators, um, 
have agreed to a concession um, and and our superintendent, as was we announced last time, has also agreed to um, to, to a concession. So um, that's it for now. Um, that was a long one, sorry. No, it was great. It was a lot of information. Um, also wanted to share that our non-bargaining units have also met. Um, so s members of the uh, central office staff have met and made concessions as well, um, in addition great. to this work that you guys have done on negotiations. April? Thank you. Um, I'll start by saying how much I appreciate um, everyone's willingness to have these difficult conversations. Um, I'm not even sure who my question is directed at, but now that the budget has passed, what are we able to do with these funds? Because I know that we are only allowed um, you know, to spend certain amounts within our um, budget categories and things like that. And so how, how does this impact, you know, what we are, what we are able to do? That's a Diane or Sandy question, <laughs> I would say. That might be a Kate question too. Um, Kate, if it's all right, I'd like to bring you over. And you should be Kate's not here. We can certainly look into that and make sure we get the right answer for you. She's here. She just needs to unmute. Hey, hey kids. I wouldn't miss this for the world. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, and and I'm really I was really listening with with almost both of my ears as I'm working on budget documents. Isn't that interesting? Um, hey, so, do you have a cot set up in your office? Is that where you sleep? Uh, yes, yes, I live here now. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, I'm building a deck out on the windows here. So, nice. Nice. excellent. Um, so, the the short answer to April's question, I think, is that these concessions will allow us to appropriately allocate the last reductions that we made. Um, to accommodate the, the reductions that the town council um, made to our budget in the last go round before we went out to referendum. Um, and, and that's really where that money is going. It's allowing us to make line item reductions in salaries um, uh, pretty much across the board. It doesn't generate enough money to do more than that really um, at my, um, calculation based on the conversations that are going on right now. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's answering the question, but it, it it's not as though we now have a new big pool of money that we can reallocate to something else. Yeah, I think, oh, can I, can I just clarify quick? Um, I think more my question, Kate, is, is do we need to meet as a finance committee or is that something that the finance committee discusses um, or at this point is it something that you know there's a, there are only certain voter categories and because that came out of staff salaries it you know it needs to be applied to certain areas like I know when we do line item transfers and things like that you know the the full board has to approve it but is this yeah. something that the school board finance committee would decide how to prioritize this money or is this something that would happen at the staff level? Um, so it's a little bit of both because what the board voted to do at their last meeting when they allocated the final reductions was to place them in the voter categories broadly, but not to place them into individual line items. Because at that time and, and still, these conversations are a little bit up in the air and we don't have specifics. Although we now have an idea of how things are, are supposed to go. Um, so in terms of process, we do need to create a new line item budget that says not just the broad categories that the voters voted on, but hey guys, here's what our real budget is. Um, those reductions again will presumably come from the salary lines all across the board for all the different categories of folks who are um, looking at making these concessions, but will also fit into the reductions that the board made at their last meeting before referendum. 
Um, so to process, what I would suggest is that the finance committee will be asked to take a look at that line item budget um, once we've prepared it based on the negotiations that are going on and then to bring that forward to the, to the board. There doesn't need to be an additional vote because the budget has been passed at referendum based on the categories, but there does need to be a look at it and a presentation, I think, um, in a public meeting that says, now we have an official line item budget, here it is, it's posted, um, and here's what it means. So that, that's how I would see it. Great, thank you, Kate. Diane? Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify because I know uh, we've been talking about this a lot and trying to work through this. Um, it, it seemed as though one of the questions I heard earlier kind of inferred that this might be some new funds that we have that are not allocated yet. And I just wanted to make sure that we're being clear that when we had that last finance meeting, we took a, we took a chunk of money out of salaries because at that time discussions were being made about concessions and so we've kind of already planned for those funds is that correct kate yeah and the the order of magnitude of that final reduction made by the town council was two hundred and forty two thousand dollars and about two hundred thousand of that was made in these sort of um, broad gesture reductions, which we hoped to be able to cover um, with some of these uh, salary agreements that are being um, reconsidered and, and renewed now. So uh, Diane's correct. I mean, basically we said, we'll find $200,000. We're gonna plunk them into these categories, which are the largest categories in terms of the number of personnel in them and um, we'll identify the individual line items later. So it, does that help? Can, am I in, can we just be, just say what I think we're all thinking, if, if these don't go through for whatever reason or in, in the event that they aren't ratified or um, there will have to be cuts to make up for that, is that correct? To make up for that $200,000 that the town council basically arbitrarily took out of our budget. Yeah, I, I think that um, depending on, on the level of the different agreements from the different groups, we would definitely be looking for additional reductions um, if any of these conversations, particularly with the two biggest bargaining units fell through. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I don't know if there's any other slides for um, committees or if we're good or if Sarah, there's anything you wanted to, not to put you on the spot. Uh, I thought the FY21 budget was my slide, so that's why I put it in the thank you thing. <laughs> I had a so, feeling yeah. it was <laughs> yours. Um, I said, this isn't mine, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, just uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, everyone, for for all of your, you know, hard work during the last couple of months, and grateful that we don't have to continue that work. That's all. all. Right. Sorry about that, Sarah, but I gave you the last word on it. Yeah. Um, moving into new business, I'd like to take ten point one and ten point two um, together. It's a meeting minutes of our May twenty first meeting and meeting minutes of June 4th, 2020 as one motion to approve as presented. So moved. Second. 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 Any discussion? And we're ready to vote. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? And Mr. Bennett? Yes. 10.3, uh, we already covered under the superintendent's report. That was the uh, motion for the litigation. 10.4.1 is the Wentworth School Social Worker. 
Sandy, do you want me to read this, or would you like to? Uh, let me see if I can get that right handy. Uh, actually, I don't have that right handy. I'm sorry. Okay. I can take it if you'd like. Okay. Um, for a Wentworth school, Alexandra Schroeder has been chosen to fill this position created by retirement. Ms. Schroeder received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology and Gender and Sexuality Studies from New York University and her Master's of Social Work from Washington University. She was a child, and child youth and family therapist in Missouri, a service coordinator in Oregon, and most re recently a day treatment clinician at Sweetser and Saco. Ms. Schroeder will be placed on step six of the master scale per the collective bargaining agreement. And the recommendation is to appoint Alexander Schroeder as a one or school social worker. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ready to vote? Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Ms. Turner? Yes. Ms. Turner? And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Thank you and welcome to Scarborough. All right, uh, 10.5, we're gonna do just one vote, but I'll read both of the motions separately. 10.5 is a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to 1MRSA 4056D for the purpose of discussing the educational support professional staff to return to public session and motion to enter into executive session pursuant to 1MRSA 4056D for the purpose of discussing the administrative staff contract to return to public session. Moved. Second. And ready to vote. Ms. Durgan. Yes. Mrs. Giftos. Yes. Dr. Gill. Yes. Ms. Casalonis. Yes. Ms. Layton. Yes. Mrs. Scyther. Yes. Mrs. Turner. And Mr. Bennett. Yes. All right. Um, if everyone could join through the secondary link, we will be back to public session in a few minutes.
think we're all back. All right, we're back. Um, which brings us to 10.7, which is the ratification of the uh, educational support professional staff. Is there a motion? So um, I'd like to make a motion to ratify the 2021 tentative agreement with the Scarborough Educational Support Staff. So moved. Second. And discussion. Hillary. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say that um, in this case, the board is ratify is voting to ratify this um, um, first. It also will need to be ratified by the educational support professionals. Um, and in this case, um, I just want to say in for the public that um, this um, this process may take a little bit longer than normal because we are out of school um, and. Um, and it needs to happen a little bit differently than it would if we were in school. Um, so just for the public um, to understand that this could be several weeks um, before the ESPs are available to ratify this. Um, and of course it's not public until it's ratified and signed by both parties. Thank you. Any other comments? I think we're ready to vote. Okay. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giptos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Sider? Yes. Mrs. Turner? And Mr. Bennett? That passes, which brings us to 10.8, which is another ratification. Um, so um, I'd like to move to ratify the 2021-22 tentative agreement that we've reached between the Scarborough Board of Education and the Scarborough Administrators. Moved. Second. And discussion? Nick? So I just, I was going to comment on the last one, but I figured I'd wait until both of them were over. So I just want to thank, say um, thank you to these two groups who were the first two um, that were bringing forward with this kind of a ratification and to look at these contracts. Everyone wants to have a three-year contract. Nobody likes to reopen a contract once it's settled, but these are unsettling times. And I, I really want to congratulate these groups as well as the groups that are to come from our district and stepping forward and and helping us make the best of a challenging situation. So I just wanted to say thank you. Hillary? Um, I'll just clarify again in this case, um, this has been ratified by the administrators um, and if it gets ratified in our vote, um, it, won't, it still won't be public until a clean copy has been signed by both parties. And once that's happened, it will be um, Public, a public document and um, posted to our website. Okay, thank you. Alicia? I just wanna say thank you to the two groups as well and echo what Nick said. Um, that's really great leadership and, and um, I'm very appreciative. Thank you. I think we're ready to vote. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giptos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Sider? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Mr. Bennett? And with that, the motion carries. And last but certainly not least is a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. No discussion, we can vote. <laughs>
Mr. Again. Yes. Mrs. Giftos. Yes. Dr. Gill. Yes. Ms. Casalonis. Yes. Ms. Layton. Yes. Mrs. Scyther. Yes. And Mrs. Turner and Mr. Bennett are not here, so uh, I think we're good. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. See you in a couple Thanks. weeks at the workshop. Have a good night. Have a good night.